race to win more and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions. Submarines, luxury underwater tourism with their killer past. The internet, the forgotten military origins of cyberspace. Fog machines, indispensable on the dance floor and the battlefield. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. Since man waged war upon the ocean, he has wanted to hide below the waves to strike at his opponents. But it was not until the 19th century that a submarine in the sense we know today became really practical. The problems that had to be solved were major. As a submarine goes deeper, the water pressure on the hull increases. To prevent the hull being crushed, it has to be made stronger, so thicker material is used. This now makes it want to sink. To counteract this, the submarine has to make itself buoyant, so it expels water from the hull and replaces it with air. Simply put, when you want to go up, you blow air into the tanks, and when you want to go down, you let water in. As early as the 16th century, this idea had been tried. William Bourne invented the idea of leather bags that could be compressed, rather like driving air, from a set of bellows. His design was adapted by a Dutchman by the name of Cornelius Jacobson Drebbel, whose submarine was successfully tested in the River Thames in 1620. A variety of man-powered machines were tried throughout the 18th and early 19th century. The Confederate submarine Hunley even managed to destroy a Union ship in the Civil War. Hunley which was this iron-cased small vessel with the crew turning the crank and the extended pole with the explosives on the end, that exploded its device against the USS Housatonic, sinking it, but of course the Hunley went down with the loss of its crew too. But if you look at the ratio, that's a tiny craft, small amount of men for a large vessel. In 1864, Spanish designer Narcis Montreal created the first air-independent system, which used peroxide as fuel and actually made oxygen as a byproduct of combustion. His design made regular dives of over two hours in duration, at a depth of 30 metres or more. As the 19th century ended, the dawn of the 20th century held it a new era of naval warfare. The Germans, uh, with their U-boats, the underwater boat, they really embraced it and of course with the introduction of the torpedo you could sink a ship without actually coming to the surface. Developments in batteries meant electricity could be used when submerged and diesel power when on the surface. Weapons were now fitted as standard with propeller driven torpedoes, effectively a small unmanned bomb that was shot through the water at the submarine's target. Military submarines today are self-contained nuclear-driven machines and carry enough nuclear missiles to devastate entire cities. They glide silently in the depths, a mere mile below the surface. These titanium steel leviathans can remain submerged indefinitely, surfacing only for food or resupply. Of course, not all submarines are for war. Triton submarines are based in Florida, USA and offer personal luxury subs that can dive up to 36,000 feet. A typical Triton submarine can be broken down into four main sections. The viewing sphere, which houses the passengers, the propulsion unit that drives the sub, the buoyancy tanks, which allow the sub to dive and float, and the electrical components, which control the complex mechanicals of the entire submarine. The history of Triton submarines is fairly contemporary. The company was formed in 2008 by my partner Bruce Jones and myself. Uh, so we've been in operation now for seven years and coincidentally the submarine that you see behind us is our seventh submarine. The company started in 2008 with just three people and today we employ 22 people here in our Vero Beach manufacturing facility. One of the challenges to making a submersible durable are really the same as the key design features of our craft, namely we had to make our submersibles simple to operate, easy to maintain, safe and reliable. 
all the onboard electronics for the submarine are built by hand. Here, all the cables for the network module are connected. The network module is the hub for all the telemetry in the submarine. Transferring the signals from the onboard computers and tablet devices, including the position and health status of the sub. Then the external electronic junction box is put together. This is a hugely important component as it configures the commands from the pilot to the submarine, from the lights to the engine thrusters. It is often referred to as the brain, and its complicated set of components can take up to six weeks to fully assemble. The electronics for the submarine not only have to be accessible and manageable, but the specialized design reflects how they are all completely self-serviceable. The best way to describe our products is that we focus on visibility, on viewing. You know, a manned submersible is a visual tool, so we've worked very hard to ensure that we've optimized viewing inside of our submersibles. If you take a look at the craft that sits behind me, the first thing that you'll probably notice is it has this gigantic acrylic sphere. And that happens to be the largest acrylic sphere ever built for a manned sub. It's 2.1 meters in diameter and 167 millimeters thick. That's seven feet in diameter and about six and a half inches in thickness. Three tons of acrylic plastic are used to produce that sphere. To control the buoyancy of the submarine, the ballast tanks are added. These two large tanks are lifted and gently taken to the submarine, where they are fitted carefully to the frame and fastened into place. We start out with this tremendous visibility from a transparent acrylic sphere, and then we shape the ballast tanks downward and forward so that they have the minimum effect on your outward view. And as well, we consolidate the machinery and equipment around the pilot in such a way that it doesn't deter or doesn't have any detrimental effect on the outward view. The submarine has about 14 hours of operational endurance and it has 96 hours, that's four solid days of self-contained emergency life support. Uh, the submarine features, among other things, multiple redundant ballast systems, uh, multiple redundant communication systems, and many other features that, that ensure the safety of the craft. The Triton submarine is a stunning piece of underwater technology, enjoyed by tourists and scientists in oceans of the world over. Used for peaceful underwater tourism today, but developed from the daring attempts to destroy enemy ships over 150 years ago. The submarine is truly a wicked invention. Since the beginning of time, mankind has pursued the need for communication, a link between people and between civilizations. Over thousands of years, we have developed the means to communicate with each other, but one invention has redefined the entire world. It has changed the way we communicate, brought the world closer together, and empowered revolutions. It has even created worlds and communities of its own. Considered by many to be the most important invention of the 20th century, this is the internet. The internet as we know it today is nothing more but a collection of computers and other devices that are connected to one another, that communicate with one another, and often connections of networks to other networks. Back in the 1950s and 60s, as the US and Russia were in the midst of the Cold War, American scientists and technology experts needed to find a way to protect their military computer and control systems in case of a nuclear attack people start thinking about how you can you create kind of systems and networks of systems that are less vulnerable to being completely disrupted by, for example, an atom bomb taking out some of the key command and control centers. You want to create this kind of um, redundant network whereby you have lots of different links between lots of nodes and you spread around all the computing and all the information across this network so that if part of it gets taken out, uh, the rest of it continues to work and critically information can still find its way across the network. One of the key ideas behind the success of this multi-node computer network was the development of packet switching. The traditional way of networking computers was through circuit switching, where a direct connection would be maintained between a device sending the message or information and the device that would receive the data. The problem with circuit switching is that it is inefficient and limits any single connection to one sole user. Packet switching is just one way of getting information from uh, a sender to a destination. With packet data, any information you want to share between two devices get chopped up in little packets of data, smaller chunks of information. So your entire message 
that is built up out of different packets can make its way across different routes over the internet and be reassembled at the receiving end in the right order. One of the great benefits of packet data, apart from some of these properties around being able to chop up data and then may have it make its own way across the internet, is that you actually use the capacity of your connections a lot better. If you have private connections between two different devices, obviously, while those devices are talking to one another, nobody else can use that particular connection. With packet data, you continuously are sharing connections and capabilities on the network. So you can actually have a network that is capable of transmitting a lot more data um, all of the time. This development was the beginning of the modern day internet. After years of research between several universities around the globe, access to the ARPANET was expanded in 1981. In 1982, the Internet Protocol Suite, or TCP IP, was standardized, and the concept of a worldwide network was introduced. TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, is really a way of making packet data work. You need to have a kind of a layer on top of that basic packet data fundamental layer, which is all about making sense of these packets and making sure, for example, you know how many packets make up your message and in what order these packets need to be arranged in order to be useful for you, which is really absolutely fundamental to the way the internet works today. So an awful lot of the applications uh, that use the internet use TCP as the fundamental building block of how they communicate with one another. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee, a British computer scientist and former CERN employee, wrote a proposal for what would eventually become the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is an example of one of the information and computing services that uses the internet to be uh, delivered to us and accessible to us. In this case, for the purpose of providing us with websites and pages of information that you can click through from one page to another, that those kind of concepts that make up the World Wide Web as we know it. By 1995, the World Wide Web was fully up and running, and the world as we knew it had changed forever. Today, the internet is everywhere. It's in our homes, in our pockets, and on our wrists. It has become an integral part of our lives. We use it to shop, bank, socialize, as well as it being a platform for entertainment in its own right. It is probably true to say that uh, the boundaries between these different applications, like for example, the web, and email and instant messaging and all those other kind of applications of the internet are starting to blur a little bit because of course people can now use web pages, a web service, to send an email through. So you get a kind of combination of these different internet technologies to provide people with, with an experience and a service that sometimes make it hard to see where the difference lies between the internet and then the services that are delivered on top of that and, and those different services and how they work together. Born out of a need to survive a nuclear war, there is no doubt that the internet is one of mankind's most important and wicked inventions. We've now seen how powerful the internet actually is, but what is actually going on under the bonnet when you are surfing the World Wide Web looking for vital information? It's just after lunch, and our intrepid tester represents a bored office worker. Instead of working, he wants to find an amusing cat image to get him through the long, repetitive working day. To begin, he needs to give his search terms to the web browser. His web browser then wraps his information into a request for the search engine, in this case, cleverly symbolized by an envelope. Oh, hello. Here comes your computer's operating system, who takes your request and then breaks it down into lots of packets of information, and then sends it across the internet to where it makes its way to Mr. Search Engine, who reassembles the data into your request. Mr. Search Engine must now make a response to your query, but where to begin? First, he breaks down your request into logical pieces and then uses a vast array of databases and complex algorithms to make an educated guess and the best matches to your response. The search engine filters these responses and breaks this data back down into packets and sends them back to you through the internet. Oh, it's your computer's operating system again. Now he reassembles all the packets of information provided by the search engine for the browser. The web browser takes this assembled data and presents them to our board worker. Our board worker 
now has a selection of funny cat photos that make him happy. And he can now spend the rest of the afternoon sending them off to his colleagues instead of doing any work. And this complex process has typically only taken half a second to complete. The Internet, a complex, amazing piece of scientific technology now used for finding amusing images. Now that is a wicked invention. The basic concept of war is to outthink the enemy to try and stay one step ahead. And technology has evolved to help the military achieve these basic war needs. One invention is used to keep military maneuvers a secret, and yet it is also commonly used in our theatre and film productions. A basic device that changes the course of wars, but also adds atmosphere to the stage. This is the fog machine. This simple device that we all know creates a dense vapour that appears to be fog or smoke. It is mainly used for entertainment, such as theatre, film productions and live music events. But it was originally a military development that has evolved to take on various forms and uses. So on the battlefield, uh, for an advancing through, it's quite difficult. But when you want it to conceal your position, moving back, retreating, or simply redeploying, it's absolutely perfect. Because if you've got a problem, you're under fire. You can carry smoke canisters where you simply pull the pin, away it goes, and uh, it will cover your withdrawal or when you move position. Smoke machines during battle have been around since the First World War, either on land or at sea. A 50-gallon drum of smoke oil could create a 60-mile smoke screen, perfect for protecting ships or advancing ground forces. Smoke grenades can also be used indoors as a distraction, cover, or as part of a rescue mission by special forces. There's the other side of using smoke or smoke flares in the military is to mark an area for supplies to be landed, for troops to be landed, and also for evacuation if you've got wounded men. There are lots of uses for, for smoke within the military which have also spilled over into the civilian air sea rescue. People, if they go down into the sea, the smoke flare that they release actually also releases a dye into the sea so that they can be seen from quite a distance. Martin Manufacturing have been producing some of the world's best smoke machines since 1996, helping create some of the best sets, stages and music venues all around the world. We started as a small company in 1984 called Gem Smoke Machine Company, which was started by one man in his backyard essentially, before we became part of the Martin Professional family in 1996 and became Martin Manufacturing UK, which is where we are now. So, how does a fog machine work? It is essentially a simple process. A specially formulated fluid is pumped into a heat exchanger and the high temperature vaporises the fluid, which expands and is forced out of the front nozzle, where the vaporised fluid mixes with the cool air and forms a smoke or fog. There's a number of processes for each machine. Uh, from start to finish, you're probably looking roughly about two hours, but that encompasses about 10 different processes, including the final assembly of the product, which takes about 45 minutes. Uh, so one person could produce about nine products per day. And I think since we launched the product about six years ago, we've produced roughly 4,000 units. The first stage of production takes place at the on-site furnace with the manufacture of the heat exchanger. Copper wire is coiled to the desired length using a mandrel machine. The coil is then heated to red-hot temperatures with a gas torch and a special heating element is inserted. It is placed in a mould and heated further with the torch. In the furnace, a raw piece of aluminium, known as an ingot, is heated to temperatures between 550 and 650 degrees Celsius. Once it is molten, it is ladled into the mould, covering the coil and element. Once it is hardened enough, it is removed from the mould and left to cool further, typically for 24 hours. The new heat exchange or block is then finished to remove any rough edges or other artefacts. The block is thermocoupled by hand to test the temperature capacity. And the holes are drilled so it's ready for the later assembly stage. At the heat exchange department, the block is placed into its metal casework. It is surrounded by pre-cut heat insulation, such as rock wall or super wall. 
A thermal trip is attached to the block and thermal wires are connected. A final piece of insulation is added and the lid fitted to the case. The elements are then bent into shape and a P-clip added for earthing. We also produce our remotes, which is an essential part of the product which operates the machine. In the past, certainly they used things like um, burning pitch, for instance, um, smoke from fires, but it, was, it wasn't controllable. Um, and the main thing is being able to control it, say, on a film set or in a theatre. The remote control is completely built by hand. Here, the buttons are attached to the back of a printed circuit board, also known as a PCB. Wires from the XLR connector are soldered onto the PCB and then screwed down. The completed front of the remote is then fitted to the back of the box before it is visually inspected and tested. All our wiring looms are all produced here as well, so that's another part of the process. We then move on to the kitting stage, so essentially all the parts come together, they're put into a kit ready for the builders on main assembly. The product is then sent up as a kit to main assembly where the final assembly process takes place, which is probably the most involved process within the whole part of the assembly. At the main production area, each worker receives a hand-picked kit box that contains all the necessary parts, metalworks and sub-assemblies that we've seen being made. From the detailed work instructions, it can take up to an hour to build a full unit. The heat exchanger is fitted into its new metal housing and connected to the PCB that operates the machine. More housing is built around the components and now the fluid container is installed and fitted into place. They're predominantly water-based fluids with two food-grade chemicals that allow you to get that kind of white, foggy effect. That's what they're there for. They're also there to allow the fog to hang around. That's the other reason for the chemicals. As I say, they're backed up by extensive health and safety reports. The remaining handles and bridging grips are attached and now the fogger is ready for testing. Before it is sent for packing, the fogger's electronics and temperatures are checked and pack tested before a full visual inspection and demonstration of the fog itself. The fog is fired into suction tubes that disperse the fog so it doesn't fill the room. There's all sorts of uses really. Um, some things that people might not be aware of is security smoke. So that's uh, quite a big industry these days. They're mainly used in banks. So if someone tries to break into a bank, they'll set off the security smoke machine, which will fill the bank in roughly 10 seconds meaning that what you can't see, you can't steal, essentially. Wind tunnel testing for, say, cars, that's one industry where you find they're used. Um, theme parks is a big one as well. They're used all over the place in all kinds of applications that we, we never expected sometimes. So there we have a unique device that entertains the masses and saves countless lives. For all of that, the fog machine is a wicked invention. So there you have it, a dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day, but have never realised their amazing background. Submarines, the internet and fog machines, all wicked inventions.